I, I would like to thank you for having me back again. Um, I really enjoyed the meeting last year. Actually, I think it's important for people who, like me, spend their life in a clinic to see kids in other settings so that we don't think everything is the way it looks in our clinic. And a lot of times it's a lot more fun outside. Um, so anyway, uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is going to require some participation from you guys. Um, what I did is kind of go um, with the idea that the questions that I get asked by email, by phone, and by people in my clinic might be worth discussing here. So I made a list of them, uh, but I don't know the answers to all of the questions. And so as we go through, if you have thoughts that you think might be helpful, I want you to raise your hand so that we can share this information and hopefully get ideas pooled. Um, and with that, I'll see if I can figure out how to use this. Okay, so the topics that we're going to go through initially are receiving a diagnosis and what that experience is like, uh, preliminary information and getting plugged in. Where do you find out even what questions you should be asking and getting your initial information? Um, and then when you find out how much there is that can be done and that is recommended, how much of that do you really need and how do you decide which things to do because there's a lot of recommendations and a lot of things that you can end up sort of ruminating on constantly. How do the needs change with time and then uh, some discussion of things that aren't medical that you may still need to think about. So, receiving a diagnosis. So when you get news, like a new diagnosis of a serious medical condition, like 1P36 deletion, um, on the right-hand side, you have the five stages of grief. That is part of it. Uh, but my experience is that the feelings that people go through are not in steps and they aren't just limited to those five things. So I made a list of some other things on the other side, uh, but it's kind of shocking. And uh, at the same time, you're trying to have a sense of hope for the future, you're also sort of dealing with the loss of what you had anticipated and hoped for, and depending on the age of the child and or the person that you're um, dealing with, uh, there can be a lot of other things going on. So it's kind of a confusing time. Um, so what I would like people to comment on a little bit is, who first noticed in that there might be a problem? Was it you? Was it somebody else? And then uh, who ordered testing? How did you confirm a diagnosis of 1P36 deletion? Uh, who told you about the diagnosis <clears throat> and what did they say? I don't know if you can read the thing on the bottom. It says, C. Bernard, Julia's approach was just a tad more sensitive Okay, so who wants another break it, another try at giving bad news? Uh, which I know that um, as a physician, I kind of feel like that sometimes. Okay, anybody want to volunteer what, how they were told? Yes. So, a brief summary so this gets on the video. Um, baby was premature by a couple of months and then just kind of not doing as well as the neonatology team had hoped. And they kept commenting on that, but just putting it off to the prematurity. Um, and that sort of mode continued until 
um, about a year when they started to recognize that maybe there was more going on, and then a number of evaluations, and finally a diagnosis uh, that was given to you by a phone call, and they, hey, we found something, which sounds like somebody was excited, and it was important news, but not necessarily good news. Okay. Um, back in the back corner. So this time, a much, a much shorter uh, pathway to the, to, to the diagnosis and more of a team approach, it sounds like. Um, still a lot of questions that weren't able to be answered. And I think that that's going to be kind of a theme as we go through the discussion today. And I know that there's a lot of other people with stories, but I want to get kind of through some, some of the other topics. We could probably spend a whole hour on this. So let's move to, okay, so now the next question is, what do you, how do you think this kind of information should be brought up. Now, the second person who spoke here was pretty easy to talk about the seizures, there was something going on. Emily and the medical team probably came to the conclusion of the first story, clearly things weren't recognized immediately. How should the idea that maybe we should look into this a little bit more be raised and what should people say when they're sort of first talking to you about a potentially significant problem? Yes. It would really be nice if your healthcare team had a way to facilitate good continuity of care. So if there were actually a way that you would work directly with your healthcare providers and people in your community that may understand a little bit more about specific, um, I mean, with, with our data, we didn't know what was happening, what was going on, of course, but had there been a, um, a way that we sat down together, which eventually did happen, where we sat down together as a family unit alongside healthcare providers after second opinions and then talked about the testing process and everything that was going to take place so that we had a better level of understanding and expectation so that we could come together. My opinion. Yeah, so that's a, actually a, this formal opinion that's published if you look this stuff up, how to give bad news, is you know, warn people that you have something important that you want to bring up and then invite the family, try to make sure that both parents are there and that they're hearing the same news at the same time. Now that's not always possible, but I was hoping that that's what people would say because your opinion as the people receiving the information is different than what's published, that's a lot bigger challenge for us. Um, any other thoughts on that? Yes, so one of the things is you recognize very early on, but knowing what the testing was being done, and then when you got the, the diagnosis, one of the key points is you can look up things and that information is helpful about what to expect. It helps to know what you should be prepared for, but saying a child will not be able to do is just asking to look bad. So. People like me should not do that. And when you hear that, which you will, uh, unfortunately, or when you read things that say, that put limits on the kids, these are generalizations. They're not individual. We have, each child is an individual, and I have found if I ever say I, that somebody won't do something, that they'll show me wrong, or they'll do something about that. The other thing is that the outcome is really a moving target. Um, most of the research that's initially published is just observational when nothing is being done and the needs of the child often haven't been defined or completely recognized and we're past that stage. 
So we, we have natural history, which is what happens if we don't do anything special for this child. We don't try to provide any interventions. And then we have modified natural history when we start to recognize the diagnosis, when we can bring people together in a group and share ideas, when we can institute early intervention services in infancy, and that does make a difference. Now, it's not a cure. We don't know everything we need to yet, but it does make a difference. Okay. So these are some of the first questions that I typically get. How long will my child live? What will he or she be able to do? Um, will this be a severe case or a mild case? What kind of treatment is going to be needed? And what's the treatment plan? And what caused this? So the answer to that is, at least initially, almost always we don't know. And that's not because we don't know anything about this condition. It's not because um, we don't care. It's not because we're not going to try to do something. This, and, and I think this is an important thing that, that doesn't get emphasized very well. The answer to most of those questions is a moving target. So how long is my child going to live depends on what birth defects are in place and on how responsive things like seizures are to medications and on how much access you have to medical care and to some extent just on luck, what happens. The tools for determining what is, how severe something is are very limited, especially in babies, but they're even limited later on. And then how do you define severity? So I had, we had an experience a few years ago where there were three families in our clinic and they were sitting around, you know, waiting to come in and then we would go and get a family and bring them back and evaluate the child and in the meantime the other two families would be out in the waiting room and they would be talking about the whole situation. It was very funny because each of the families commented on how how they felt about the other families. And like, oh, I just admire them so much. I don't know how they can deal with this. That is such a difficult thing, and we are so fortunate with what we have. But they each said it about all the other families. Now, every family had the worst in the eyes of the people looking at them, and each of the families felt like they were fortunate because they had some idea of what they were dealing with and thought it would be overwhelming to be dealing with the problems that the other families had. And we see a lot of that. Now, you will pick up on negative vibes from healthcare workers because they're looking at it and they can't imagine what it's like to be in your shoes. And that's overwhelming. But that doesn't mean that they don't care about your children or think they're worthwhile, it means that they often wish they could do more and are feeling their own limitations. Um, so for right now, severity depends on manifestations. Plan also depends on the specific needs of the child and those are not static either. So again, there's a lot we don't know. This is good news in a lot of ways because if this were fixed at birth, then support would be important for a meeting like this, but our ability to improve the outcome for these children would be very limited, and I don't think it is. I think that there's a lot that can be done, but we have to learn more to be able to do it. In the meantime, we need to take advantage of the things that we do have that are available. Okay, now we're getting to your comment. So, what do I really need? This is a list that I came up with in about a 20 minute search on 1P36 of the things that are recommended that you will probably need. So, primary care physician, that one's pretty easy, but 
who has time to get that many specialists on a regular basis? And, you know, how many, if you see each one of those people once a month, then what else do you have time for? So let's go kind of go through. Uh, now, we're going to spend some time on, on this slide. First, let's talk about what does the geneticist do? Now, I have my ideas what a geneticist should do. But I want you guys to tell me what did genetics do in your child's case? Just a couple of people, quick answers. Yes. So just gave the name of the condition. Any counseling with that? No. Okay. And you've said a lot of good things. Who is this person? Dr. Parsick from uh, U.S. Chance in Florida. Okay. Area. Remember that name. That's a good geneticist. Okay. Um, he's actually been with us, too. But, okay. Um, and then he did genetic counseling for us. Um, he eventually made do some testing on a few of my other kids. Uh, he's not testing on my two-year-old. So he, he's doing a lot of management kinds of things. Okay. Yes. Okay, so that's the opposite end of the spectrum. <laughs> Won't talk too much about that. Um, my, my view on what a geneticist's role is, one is definitely being involved in diagnosis. The second thing is somebody needs to know about the rare diseases, and 1P36 is one of those. It's currently caused by changes. And I have been pushing my colleagues to role in sort of sitting down at the table when plans are being made, helping to implement, and making sure that right prioritization is other roles. Now, to do that, I have to know what the natural history is and uh, be willing to sit down and, and do that. Some genetics clinics honestly are understaffed and not going to be able to do that. But ideally, that's what I think the genetics should do, is kind of the description that was given in the first case. Yes. So a shared decision-making model, and that, I, I agree that that is kind of the ideal. Um, some physicians will want to tell you what to do, other physicians will want you to tell them what to do, but neither of those is very efficient. It should be an open discussion. You guys are going to recognize things that we don't, and we're going to have access to some things that you don't, and so we need to work together. Okay, neurology. We're going to have to move on. What? Do you, okay, neurology. How many of the children with 1P36 deletion have a neurologic problem? Pretty much all of them. Okay. Okay, we have one, or maybe two. So, and neurologic problems can, that, that's a very broad spectrum. That includes hypotonia, it includes the oromotor problems that interfere with speech, it also includes seizures and some other things. So, many of the symptoms related to this are neurologic. Now, does that mean that every child with 1P36 needs to be followed? regularly by a neurologist. It depends on the setting in your community. So in Cincinnati, the neurologists don't really want to take care of the hypotonia or the speech problem, but they want to be involved with the epilepsy. And so in Cincinnati, the kids with seizures clearly need to see the neurologist. They, depending on which neurologist we pick, may or may not be helpful for some of the other problems. And 
um, and so some of some of my patients with 1P36 do not see a neurologist. Some of them do. Um, you need to know where the local pediatric neurologist is, however, I think in all cases. And neurology is clearly a key feature. How many of the kids have heart problems? So we got a lot of people raising their hands, but not as many. The published statistics, it looks like about half of the kids have a heart problem. However, most of, at least in the published data, most of the kids have not required interventions for their heart problems. We do have some who have very serious heart problems, even life-threatening. So an initial evaluation by a cardiologist, ongoing management depends on the nature of findings. If there is a cardiomyopathy that's interfering with heart function, or a heart malformation that requires either medicines or surgery, you need your cardiologist. If the heart is structurally normal, you don't need your cardiologist in the, on a long-term basis. So there's not, as far as we know, there's, it's unlikely that a child who initially has a healthy heart will develop a, a new problem that hasn't been recognized. Endocrinology. What do the endocrinologists do? What's their role in 1P36? So thyroid functions, but your primary care physician, your geneticist, and your neurologist can order those. So when, when you need the endocrinologist is if you have an abnormal thyroid study or if you have another hormonal problem, um, if you're considering growth hormone therapy for a child whose growth is very impaired, then you need the endocrinologist. Every family doctor. Now, I'm not trying to discount by, um, endocrinologists. If the endocrinologist shows a an interest in some of your other doctors don't, you may want to keep them just for that. Um, but endocrinology is, is less likely to have a, an active hands-on role in all cases. Okay. What ophthalmology is probably something that you do every child. They can have strabismus, which is crossing of the eyes. Uh, they can have nearsightedness, farsightedness, but they can also have things like cataracts and colobomas. Okay, audiology. What's that? Audiology, um, hearing tests. They get a lot of um, fluid in the ears, creating hearing problems that are conductive. Some sensory neural hearing problems so hearing screening needs to be done. Now, one of the questions is how often does that need to be done? In a lot of places, hearing screen is part of the newborn screen. If a child has passed that, then unless they develop some sign of a hearing problem, you may not need to go back to an audiology. Um, on the other hand, if they have a hearing problem, you're going to need to work on that. They do have interventions that they offer. Uh, physical therapy for muscle tone, occupational therapy for fine motor skills, and for um, suggestions for devices that can be helpful. Speech therapy, um, probably a key feature for this. Communication is one of the major uh, difficulties that we find with 1P36. What about physical medicine? Who, who works with a physical medicine doctor? What do they do? Yeah, so scripts for things like wheelchairs, walkers, um, bracing. So physical medicine is rehabilitation doctors. And they, one of the things that pediatric rehab does is 
things like cerebral palsy. So they have a lot of knowledge on mobility and their role is to find ways of uh, augmenting function. Yeah. Physical medicine doctors who know pediatrics are not a dime a dozen. They're not on every street corner. So, um, but if they are, if you're dealing with those issues, they are people worth at least knowing about. Now, you, in some places, other doctors will take on those roles just because there's not a lot of physical medicine doctors around. Um, orthopedics, most kids may not need that. If they develop scoliosis, you'll need that. If you have club foot um, or other bony abnormalities, you'll need an orthopedics doctor, but you don't automatically need to default to that. Uh, same things for surgery. Now, developmental pediatrics, um, that, the role for them is highly variable. The first developmental pediatrician I met saw people one time, wrote a list of recommendations and discharged them from follow-up. And I thought, why would anybody even do that? But I also thought that about genetics when I first found out that that's what a lot of people did. Um, on the other hand, other developmental pediatricians give medicines for behavioral management, will go to the schools and meet with the school and help write the IEP, and that is a service worth looking for. So you want to know who takes those roles in your community. Um, gastroenterology will be important only if you're dealing with severe reflux or severe constipation. On sort of the normal level of those things, your pediatrician can usually deal with. Um, and we'll kind of move on to the next. Okay. Can you move the slide forward? Okay. So again, lots of things. So suggestions for priorities. My suggestion is that you don't need to do all of these things at once. You can't solve all of the problems at the same time. So choose the important thing. What is the thing that is most immediately important and get a handle on that. And when you feel comfortable with that, then pick up a next problem or the next specialist. That doesn't mean you then quit going back to the one that you've been working on, but you don't have to take them all on at the same time. It is okay to have limits. It is even okay to say, you know what, for the next month, I'm not gonna do one P36. And try to have what you consider a more normal life. You don't have to do this 100% of the time. I worry when I see families that jump in too much. I, I also am involved with some other conditions. Uh, one of them is 22Q11 deletion. We had a person in Cincinnati who decided that there, because her son had that, she was going to start a support group and teach the doctors about the syndrome and go to the state and advocate for these kids to get them better services. And she jumped in and did that very, very intensely for about five years. And nobody stepped up to help her. And at the end of it, she couldn't speak to us without being irate. And what she had built completely fell apart because she had put too much in and there wasn't enough left to finish the race. And we do not want that to happen. That's not good for you. It's not good for your child. So this is a marathon. We want long-term outcomes. We want long-term levels of function. And that requires going in at a pace that we can sustain. Okay. Changes, I'm gonna run out of time here. Uh, 
changes over time. So one of the reasons that follow-up is important and that I think I need to see people back is because the needs of a newborn are different than the needs of a child that's getting ready to go into preschool. And that is different than the needs of the child who is in middle school. And these plans have to be updated. I had a child that I saw who then didn't come back and 10 years later, they were still doing the same thing. They still got the monthly delivery of the same supplies that the child needed as a newborn, and nobody had changed the plan. We don't want that to happen. We need to think about what is the appropriate use now and update that, and the questions that I I ask, and the questions that your doctors are asking, in an infancy, we're going to be focusing a lot on feeding, on growth, on social connectedness, and smiling, cooing, things like that. Those aren't the questions that I'm going to ask in middle school. We're going to be talking mobility. We're going to be looking still at growth. And uh, you know, the, you know, how much detail you give to somebody really depends on how involved they are um, with you and with your child. You don't need to say the same thing to everyone. Uh, most people are pretty comfortable talking to family. We do meet some people. Um, I've had some families where they did not want grandma and grandpa to know. And. Sometimes that's because of the attitudes that have previously been expressed by the grandparents. Sometimes it's other reasons, but finding ways of having open communication. How many of you need support? Yeah. I, everybody needs support. So being able to talk and being at least to some extent, open with family is important. Um, does 1P36 have an impact on your social life? <laughs> and how do you deal with that? You know, how, how do you find a way of having social interaction? <laughs> it's a rare occasion I get to go do something. You know, we're never actually dining together or together. One of us is always off with of years it was very hard and but they they are a very social family I'm kind of a quiet stay-at-home guy myself but this family was very social and it was really hard on the parents and then we sort of said well you know you can't you don't feel comfortable going out so a bunch of us that were their friends said, well, why don't we just go in and so we all made foods and things that would be appropriate for us and then showed up on their doorstep and said, hey, we want to have a party at your house. Um, you know, it worked out. And since then, we have at least one event a year at their house because they can't both go out at the same time. He requires full-time care and does not deal with going out into a restaurant or something. And that can be recognized. So there are ways to work around that. On the other hand, there are certainly a lot of kids who can go out and looking at the, seeing what the possibilities are is important. Work. Does 1P36 interfere or complicate your work life? Yeah. It's a big issue. And that's a normal thing. But how do you deal with that?
you have to deal with it. You have to work something out. I have known people who lost jobs over a child's illness. That should not happen. Um, I get asked to fill out paperwork probably a quarter of the time when I see somebody because they need documentation that this was a legitimate medical issue. You know, but if you need that, if you need some physician to write a note and say, this is what we're dealing with and this is why this parent needs to be in the office today, um, ask. I can't guarantee that everybody will be willing to fill it out, but I know that a lot of people will. It should not interfere too much, but it is complicating. I mean, I understand why bosses don't like it when people aren't at work, because they have other things to do, but these kids need to be cared for, and there is a balance issue that needs to be done. Um, all of these things are issues. And it's a matter of looking at the big picture, prioritizing, and then getting to the bottom line and saying, okay, these are the priorities. Let's take care of the important things first and then not try to plug in all the details and erase the disease. 1P36 is going to be a part of your life, at least unless somebody comes up with a cure. Um, we are looking at possibilities for treatment, however. Um, 1P36 I can't specifically talk to, but it used to be believed that anything that causes developmental handicap is by definition untreatable, other than sort of early intervention kinds of things. There are now clinical trials being done for Fragile X Syndrome and for Down Syndrome that have the same kinds of developmental disabilities that 1P36 does because they've developed some understanding of the neural pathways involved. They're looking promising. The same thing can happen for 1P36. So we need to keep hope. Yeah. This is going to be a long distance into the future. Okay, I'm not socking around the corner. Um, Yes, that is what I am saying. The thing that's being done in um, Down syndrome, so what they did with Down syndrome, which is a whole extra copy of a chromosome, um, is they, they looked at functioning. They also looked at the brain and to try to find out where the imbalances were. A lot of that work was done with animals that made up with Down syndrome. And they learned a lot about what the problem was neurologically. And then that, that caused some chemical imbalance in, in the brain. So that there are some chemicals at too high or, or too low levels. And then the scientists looked at that and said, hmm, this drug changes the level of that chemical in the brain. I wonder if we give that, will it help to normalize? And they're a long way from having a treatment to cure Down syndrome. But they have four or five drugs that are now being looked at that, at least in the animal model, partially normalize the brain chemistry and show some in improved neurologic function. Similar process for Fragile X Syndrome, which is a single gene disorder, but it causes a lot of things to be abnormal in the brain. So it's helping the brain to partially compensate is one approach. Another approach that is being looked at, not in those two conditions, but in some others, is actually getting genes replaced into some of the cells. Now, now, is this something that we're going to be doing in the next five years? Um, is this something where we may have some options in the next 10 to 15 years, possibly? 
the possibility that we can treat this kind of a neurologic and developmental problem is, is a new concept. But I think it's something that's important. We need to have hope. We need to be looking to the future, and there are some reasons to have that hope. In the meantime, the early intervention things that we do are not trivial. Working with a child makes a difference. Every disease that has been studied, if you know what to expect and you put in interventions to maximize performance in those areas, results in a better outcome. Improved quality of life and improved quantity of life. And there are too many diseases to even go through the list where that has been shown. That presumably is also true in 1P36.